Welcome, glad you're here today. You're here early today. You got to uh, experience uh, our reception of the catechumen. We received one of our inquirers uh, our into the catechumen. And uh, glad to have you out here. And uh, I will begin his journey. And as you've heard in these uh, wonderful prayers that we do before everyone is received into the church, we come against the forces of darkness right away. We don't hold back. We know that that's really what our enemy is. Our enemy is not each other. It is not people. We get this out of our heads. It's not people that are enemies, right? It is the devil and all his workings, the spiritual powers of darkness that careen around us all the time to try to distract us, to try to get us off track, okay? This is not the way. God has called us to the way. And the way is to really stand up against the evil one and his works and his minions and his powers. And when they come, you say no. And you stand firmly against them. You heard in these prayers how dogmatic we are, firm we are about the devil, right? We don't hold back. I've had experiences with this myself personally, and I know you must be bold and strong and not have any fear. Because there is no fear when you have Christ, because he's conqueror of death and the defeater of demons. This is what he does. This is who he is. This is what the church is about. Again, the church is a place of healing. That's why people join. They come to the church to gain healing, to gain peace. And we come here for also the tools for our armament. When we go out these doors, we have to do battle with the enemy, with those spiritual darkness. We have to have the right tools and the right armaments to be able to do that. Well, today we have this really perplexing parable, don't we? This parable of the talents. We've probably heard this many times. I know I've preached on it and spoken of it many times. It's about these three men who receive from, is a parable, of course, which is a way to teach us something. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what's being taught? What are we trying to pull out of this, right? We're not going to get bogged down in all the technicalities of this parable, because that's not the point of the parable. Nor is it the point of any story, really. The story is to come to the point. To the and in this parable, we have these three individuals who are given uh, a certain amount of money. Uh, one was given a large amount, a medium amount, and a small amount. But each were asked, really, and expected to make something with that that they were given. So this parable really is about, uh, it's actually about the uh, way in which uh, we have, our, in our spiritual lives, been given many gifts. God has given you a gift. He gives each of us gifts. And those gifts, we can either take them and use them and multiply them, or we can, quote unquote, bury them like the guy in the parable did, right? And when we bury our gifts, we bury what God has given us and say, well, here it is, Lord, I give it back to you. The Lord says, and you know, notice his attitude toward this man at the end, right? He's going to be going to hell and then weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we're like, wow, this guy really got, really got it for, for, for not doing anything with what he was given. And so, you know, it kind of should be a wake up call to us, right? If you're not doing something with what God has given you, then perhaps you are in trouble. Perhaps you should be worried. So God calls us to take what the talents we have, what we have given, and to use them for his good and to multiply them, literally to advance them, to make them more, right? And this has, in your life, specifically to do with you, where you're at. What it is that you have in your life. What have you given to God? You know? Uh, maybe nothing. Uh, maybe everything. I don't know. Last week we had a, a, a passage in Colossians, which we're going to continue that passage today. But last week the passage in Colossians was about putting off the old man, right? Putting off all of these things. And we talked a lot about, a little bit about those things, those, those dark side things. Put them off. Right, and I think we had the example of uh, of the saint of last week, which I cannot remember his name at this moment. But uh, I remember his story that he put everything away from him. He left it all. It was a friend. <laughs> he left everything, right? And he ran toward God. And this is our attitude, right? So this parable really is teaching us this. And in Colossians, it was teaching us even more because um, this is how this church is structured. By the way, we have a gospel reading that gives us a kind of an opening introduction and uh, like a parable like today and then it follows up with an epistle reading which usually I like to call the application of the parable, right? How does it apply to us? How do we make it work in our lives? 
So today, this is a, really a, a response to that. Last week, Colossians was about putting off the old man, putting off those things that you know in your conscience, you know in your deep heart, are actually not good things. There are things that pull you away, the things that uh, are selfishness-driven, things uh, that are driven about you know, fulfilling our pleasures and our own needs only, uh, and not thinking about other people. And this is contrary to Christian thought and really contrary to the original uh, uh, purpose for humanity, right? Always has been about the other and about caring for one another. So let's look a little deeper in there into Colossians. So it says, therefore, as the elect of God, in other words, as those who have been called by God, holy, meaning separated and pure and pious and beloved, he says, put on. Now, this is a great word. We have this word put to death on the other passage. And now we have this idea of putting something on, right? And you notice that a priest always has to wear these garments, you know? This is what we put on. We literally have a whole process of putting on garments before you come. I have a little area there where I put on all of these different garments. In each garment, I say a prayer before I put it on. A special prayer designed for this particular garment, right? Like the cuffs, they represent... Uh, the righteousness of God and how he is holy and good and the belt of truth, right? Um, every part of this vestment represents something for God. So in, in our lives, we have to do kind of the same thing with these virtues that God has given us. We have to literally kind of like fit into them, right? And sometimes it takes a little bit of a getting adjusted to put him on a new garment, right? With vestments, they're heavy and they're weighty and you can tell that they're there, right? There's no question that you have something on. This is, should be how it is with the virtues. We should be putting on the virtues, right? Carefully noting what they are and say, you know, I want to have more of this virtue in my life. I need this. And so we have to literally strive for it, look for it. How can I do this in my life? How can I make this virtue happen? A lot of times we think, well, the virtues will just plop upon us, but we do have to be putting them on, it says. We can't just wait for someone to put them on us, which is sometimes I think what we do, right? We kind of walk around expecting things to happen to us, but without any responsibility on our own. So this is the responsibility of us, is to put on, and then he says, what are we to put on? When we're holy and beloved, we're chosen by God, what do we put on? And he says right here clearly, put on, the first one I love is tender mercies. Tender mercies. When I was uh, much younger, I was seeking to find out where the true church was. And so my wife and I and some friends of ours, we studied the scriptures and we looked at the book of Acts and we said, well, it must be living in the community. So I said, let's start a commune. So we did. We started a commune and we lived, uh, we bought a house together with 11 other people and we lived in a house, we had our own house church. Uh, we had people upstairs, people downstairs, we cooked meals together. We didn't share our finances, but we shared all the house finances and shared our food, and, uh, and our lives were interpenetrated by this experience. But even doing that, we still felt like we were missing something, of course, and that's when we, later on in our lives, discovered the Orthodox Church and found that this is where the true community is. But one of the things that we did was we named our community, and like a church names its church, right? And so we called it Hesed Community, Hesed. And Hesed is a, is a Hebrew word that literally means tender mercies. So for us and for me, when I see tender mercies, I think of community, right? I think of this bond that we have between each other and how important that bond is. And just a little note on that. In the early church, you know, the liturgy uh, is, was very similar to the liturgy that we're celebrating today. But in the early church, they actually had their agape meal before the service. So they had their fellowship and their, their, their time together, and then they came over and worshiped together. Now, of course, over time, the church flipped that around, and now our meal is afterwards, because the church felt there was a need to be prepared for this service, and to spend some time in fasting and, and preparation for it, and so they flipped them around and put them the other way. But always, the fellowship, the community, the connection to one another has been a natural and, and outflowing part of what the true church is really all about. And if you find a church that doesn't have community, even an Orthodox church, I would say it's, it's probably fallen away. And many times there were churches that would later, and you can read about this, that would become inhabited by demons. Because the only thing that people were doing there was reform. 
but they didn't have the community. They didn't have the life. They didn't have the heart. And so we're not immune just because we have these beautiful icons and we have this beautiful incense and we have all these lovely things. Without the heart, without the community, it's worthless and pointless. So we must also always put on tender mercies. Because tender mercies, brothers and sisters, relate to us, don't they? We have to be tender and merciful with one another. Because we're all prone to be angry. We're prone to be a little vindictive. Uh, we're prone to be a little bit on the side of, uh, I want my way. You know, I want church like I want it. Or I want to do what I want to do. And so we're always on that side of things. So we have to return back to these tender mercies with one another. And then other things like kindness. Right? Kindness. How do you put on kindness? We have to find ways to be kind. Find ways how we can minister to other people. Very important. Some years ago, I watched a, uh, uh, a really interesting like documentary about a guy who decided he wanted to get in a car and travel from Alaska to Mexico, and he didn't want to have any money. He had nothing on him but his car. And it was like a little Volkswagen bug. And he started and just kept driving. When he was about to run out of gas, he pulled into a gas station in town, and he would ask people to help him. And he did this all the way from Alaska to Mexico. And he didn't have a problem. And I'm like, wow. It's, you know, and you watch, of course, he was doing a film, so there was obviously that with it. But, you know, there was people that rejected him. There were people that said, no, I can't help you. But by and large... People were very kind. And I think this is also a misconception that some people have of our country. You know, that other parts of the world think that we're the great evil, you know? And we scratch our heads and go, oh, what do you mean? Uh, you've never been here. Because when you come around, you'll find that people generally are kind and good people. Because people want to put on kindness. They want to be kind. It's a natural inclination of our humanity. Put on humility. Another thing that's very hard to put on. Because we want to be seen. We want people to notice us. We like it when people catch our eyes and see us and watch what we're doing. And that can be prideful. And so we always have to be on the alert and be humble. One of the primary virtues of the church is humility. You'll find this in all the saints. Their attitude. When they come to church, it's an attitude of piety and humility. An attitude that is seen especially in the way we make the cross. The sign of the cross and the way we bow. The way we lean forward toward God. Humility. Meekness is connected with humility. Uh, you know, the meek will inherit the earth, it says. Are you meek? Are you allowing others to kind of have the word and you to step back? Or do you want to demand your way? Long suffering. Are we finding ways that we can deal with our issues more patiently, right? Can you deal with your issues of, of uh, you know, pain that you have? Can you deal with your issues of other people around you who are, you know, frustrating you or angering you? You know, can you put off uh, and be long-suffering in, in someone else's struggle? These are difficult things, but things that we need to put on. It says we need to bear with one another. And I would say, and really I'm thankful that in our parish we have been doing this. I see many of you bearing with the struggles of other people. We do this by praying for one another. By calling, by caring, by asking how are you, and visiting people in their need. Bearing with one another, and then finally forgiving one another. It's hard to forgive. It's hard to let go of past hurts. But these are all the things, brothers and sisters, that we are called to do. We are called to offer ourselves to one another. It says, if anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. And then above all, we must put on love. Because it is the love that motivates us for all these other things, isn't it? It's the love that motivates us to forgive. It's the love that motivates us to not be prideful. It's the love that motivates us to be long-suffering, to be meek, to be kind. This is God's goodness. This is the way he operates. And this bond is a bond of perfection. It's no longer about the details of the law. It's about love. And then he finally says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body. This body, this community is called to a bond of peace. The bond of peace has to be fleshed out, doesn't it? In our own lives. And sometimes uh, things aren't always peaceful, but that's okay. 
We are always striving in that direction and looking for that because we are called. And finally, called to be thankful. We have to put on thankfulness. Are you thankful for the good things that you have? Are you thankful for what God has done for you and in you? So now just going over just a few of these virtues, right? Do you see how this parable makes its application, right? Clearly, the man with the five talents, he went out and was given many virtues, and he added to those virtues. He added to them. He built up his spiritual life. So did the man with the second talents. At least he made a couple. But when we take what God has given us, even if it's just one thing, and we hide it away, God does not want us to do that. He wishes us to offer these things so that we can be this community of God. We can be this light for those around us. And we can truly be what he calls us to be. So take this in your consideration. And as it closes in this uh, passage of scripture, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. That's what we do here. We sing, right? It's all about us giving back to God and giving to each other. So let's encourage one another with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to you forever.